53 through 56. It can be found on pages 50 and 51 of the New Testament section of the Sanctuary Bible. The apostles gathered and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Not many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to a land at Genetaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into the villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. So, if you were paying attention during the children's sermon, you probably got 50% of the point of today's sermon. So, however, however, I think it was Carmen Feldman approached me a week and a half or so ago and, and asked if I was going to tell some funny stories, and the answer to that is yes. So I'm going to pretend like you didn't hear the children's sermon. I'm going to start from scratch. Okay, so here we go. When I was little, if I was misbehaving, which I did a lot, I had what was called a smart mouth. <laughs> Who would have thought? My grandpa Baird would start talking about the boot and shoe business. Okay, so what exactly is the boot and shoe business? Well, um, perhaps grandpa Baird was talking about selling or fixing boots and shoes. Well, <laughs> he was an electrician, not a cobbler, so uh, that, that doesn't really make sense. Perhaps what Grandpa Baird was talking about was punishment and discipline. Ooh. Okay, so how would that work? Okay. This is the shoe. This is my behind. Boom, boom, boom. That's the boot and shoe business. So back then when physical punishment was a bit more common than it is today, back then, yeah, it, it was more common than it is today. However, my grandfather never kicked me, but I knew when it was time for me to settle down. Here's another example. If you have a certain age, you remember the paddle that was used as punishment in junior high and senior high school, yes? Anybody remember that? Yeah, it was made of uh, hardwood, a maple, or, or, or something heavy duty. Uh, and it was about that long and had a carved end that was uh, about, the, about the dimension of a handle on a baseball bat. So a uh, bit more substantial than the plywood paddle I was talking to the kids about. Now this paddle may or may not have had holes in it, that might have been an urban legend, the holes, the holes part. They did? Oh, see, see, we got somebody who's had experience. Okay, so perhaps the purpose of the hole was uh, to hurt you more when they struck you behind. Mm -hmm. Or certainly it would make a really scary whistling uh, sound when it was swung through the air. Whoosh! Whoosh! So that's scary, good, proper. So I never personally witnessed this particular paddle design, only the no-hole design. So let, let me tell you about that. 
So my personal experience with the paddle, that's hard to believe that I might have misbehaved enough to deserve the paddle, but yes, I did. In junior high school marching band practice, we were out marching in the parking lot, and the boys were fooling around, not paying attention. So the, de the d director had just had it up to there, you know? So he marched all the boys into the boys' restroom, lined us up, and one by one, we heard the dreaded phrase, grab your ankles, okay? And one by one, we grabbed our ankles, and each of us got one whack from the paddle, okay? So discipline was a bit different back then. Today, I want to look at God's discipline in two different ways. Let's start with the Bible passage from Psalms. Okay, so this passage can be read as four separate sections. Verses 20 through 29, the first section. Some of the, some of the words or phrases indicate what God thinks of David. He's my servant, I anointed him, I will crush his foes. Faithfulness and steadfast, steadfast love shall be with him. Highest of the kings on earth, I will establish his line forever. Some phrases that might even have been said by an earthly parent. Next comes verses 30 through 32. Some phrases indicate what could bring on the need for God's discipline or punishment. Verse 30, his children forsake me, or forsake my law, or don't live according to my ordinances. Okay. So according to Barnes notes, the author may be referring to David's successors on the throne rather than his actual children. Verse 31, violate my statutes, do not keep my commandments. Again, according to Bard's notes, God may have two objectives. The first one is show displeasure with their conduct or punish them. The second thing is reclaim them, but in a way that shows his disple displeasure. Again like a loving parent. So then comes verse 32. Then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with scourges. And indicate, indication of what, God, what God's punishment might be. Sounds like a little bit like the boot and shoe business, doesn't it? However, however when it's God's shoe and God's business, human punishments pale in comparison. So then come verse 33 through 37, God's commitment to David and his successors, even if punishment is necessary, verse 33, will not remove my steadfast love. Verse 34, will not violate my covenant. Verse 36, his, that's David's line, shall live forever. I have always been a wee bit uncomfortable with the God that's described in the Old Testament compared to the New Testament. So let's look at some comparisons. In the Old Testament, God is uh, depicted as angry. In Exodus 4, 14, then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. Or how about Numbers 11, verse one. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. How about wrathful? Deuteronomy 9, 19. I feared the anger and wrath of the Lord, for he was angry enough to destroy you. Or how about 2 Chronicles 36, uh, verse 16. But they mocked God's messengers and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. Oh, wow, okay. So demanding, there's another description of God from the Old Testament. Genesis 9, verse 5. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting from every animal and from every human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Or Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it, for the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. So, you know, 
you can see why people get the feeling that, oh boy, God is kind of scary in the Old Testament. In the New Testament now, God is, can be thought of as loving. Uh, John 3.16, very famous passage for, for, uh, from, from the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then also from John chapter 14, verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. All right, another attribute of God, forgiving in the New Testament. Ephesians 4, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God in Christ, God forgave you. Or patient. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Or how about 2 Peter, verse 3, up chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting to, anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So today's psalm reiterates that God's anger is tempered with love. There's always punishment for misbehavior, but God will never withhold his love, even though he's kind of scary in the Old Testament but he will never withhold his love. So that's a good example to follow when we are fed up with our kids or a situation or our boss or our job. So let's look now at the New Testament reading. Perhaps there's a little bit different take on discipline. So let's start with the definition of discipline from Merriam-Webster. The first definition, there are always multiple definitions, and you know, back in school you're supposed to write some definitions for words, and I always picked the one that was the shortest, you know, less writing. Anyway, the first definition, to punish or penalize for the sake of enforcing obedience and perfecting moral character. This sounds like the boot and shoe business, all right. Also sounds like what's going on in verse 32 of Psalm 89, punish their transgression with the rod. The second definition, to train or develop by instruction and exercise, especially in self-control. So I might add to that by instruction or example. This sounds more like what Jesus was exhibiting in the passages from Mark. So in verse 30, the apostles were eager to tell of what they had done and taught. So you can imagine the disciples almost jumping up and down with excitement to tell Jesus what was going on. So according to McLaren's expositions, the order of the words done and taught hints that the apostles may have thought more of what they had done than actually, actually teaching about Jesus. So Jesus recognized that they needed a little calming down time. Certainly the disciples were very excited about what they had been doing. Oh yeah, you can just see him. Oh yeah, guess what we did, guess what we did. So Jesus recognized they needed to simmer down a little bit. Perhaps they were missing the point of it all. They should be thinking about teaching about Christ and not necessarily what they were doing. Maybe Jesus also needed a little quiet, solitary time to rest and renew. We all need that. We all need that. So in verse 31, Jesus said, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. However, the time to rest was soon interrupted. The crowd followed them by a faster route, and they were waiting when Jesus and the disciples got there. So a similar thing was going on in Mark uh, uh, 6, verses 53 through 56. Jesus was forced to continue his ministry to the people without resting. When things are piling up, 
Have you ever said, give me a break? I certainly have. That is not what Jesus said or did. Jesus felt the discipline, second definition, of his mission. He resumed addressing the needs of the crowd without rest. He led by example and was a good example to the disciples. Jesus, Jesus acted with discipline rather than disciplining his disciples for their, their excessive or misdirected enthusiasm. So it's interesting how these two definitions of discipline can be juxtaposed on two of the readings in, from today's lectionary passage. Now, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm going to admit to you that I did something I don't normally do. I went to the lectionary and picked two passages from the lectionary rather than picking a sermon title and then finding Bible passages to fit. That's not really a good thing to do. So I actually used the real lectionary passages. Okay, so in conclusion, here are the takeaways, and you probably already guessed them. God disciplines sometimes harshly, but always with love. Jesus accepts the discipline of his mission, but always with love and patience. The word in both situations, the key word, is love. Here are some questions for your consideration, for my consideration too, of course. Discipline, first definition, do we ever get, let anger override our love when we discipline? Ooh, maybe sometimes. What about frustration? Does that ever get in the way of, uh, of uh, our love when we discipline? Well, how about discipline the second definition? <clears throat> Do we exhibit Jesus' love and patience as we follow the discipline of our Christian faith? That's our example. Christ is our example, and that is the way we should behave. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thanks for loving us even when we misbehave. Thanks for sending Jesus to teach us the discipline of Christian life through words and example. Amen.